Hi all, welcome to the April Agile Austin Coaching Meetup. Um, my name is Sid Markle. I'm one of the hosts of the meetup tonight, uh, along with Samira, uh, who has is joining me tonight, and she's going to be helping uh, watch the chat. And we'll both be watching chat and helping facilitate the conversation. Um, we're really excited to be here. Samira, do you want to say anything before I move to the next slide? I will be helping to support the question. So we did check with Anthony. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to come off mute. Or if you prefer to put it in the chat, I'll keep an eye out and then I will let Anthony know what the question is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, so let's move forward. So what, who are we and, and why are we here? We're the Agile Austin Coaching Meetup. And what our focus is really around building up um, coaching skills for agilists. We want to go into monthly conversations in a broad variety of topics that can help us do better at our craft, the, co the craft of coaching. We meet the first Monday of every month. Um, and as we explained before, we'll facilitate the questions. Um, and Anthony is good with everybody coming in. We want to ha have a more conversational style tonight. You are encouraged to engage in whichever way is best for you. If chat's best for you, fine. If you'd like to come off and raise your hand, that's great too. And if at any point during the conversation you need anything, just direct message myself or Samira and we'll help take care of you. So that's a little bit about what to expect. We are part of a larger organization called Agile Austin, and, and that mission of that organization is to really connect people and foster professional growth through collaborative events like this one. It is a nonprofit and it's been running for many years. It's been, we just had a successful Keep Austin Agile conference where we had, I think, 300 people register. It was both virtual, hybrid, in person, and online. That was really a lot of fun. We also have a lot of, a couple of other meetup categories. So we're one of several, right? So we're the Agile Coaching Meetup. We focus really in on the craft of coaching and helping coaches build their practice. But we also have a book club. We have a, a meetup that talks about working at scale. We have a brand new one that just launched last week, I think, AI and product, because um, that's a big topic these days. In fact, it's one of the, it's the topic for tonight, right? So we have a leaders topic and a lean Kanban topic. But if any of these interest you, you can find them all under the header of Agile Austin at meetup.com. We have sponsors that help support the organization. They keep us going and we're very, very appreciative of them. And tonight I want to introduce you to, um, oh, I had my notes and I lost them. Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wing it here. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Anthony um, Coppedge tonight. He's going to be talking about uh, transforming feedback into action. Anthony and I have known each other for many years. We worked together starting back in 2019. And throughout that time, look at the ice on the floor. Oh, we got a little type, a little mute there. I'm going to do that. Uh, throughout that time, I've learned so much from Anthony. He's a mentor. He's a thought provoker. He has the best questions. And the other thing about Anthony is he is so good at creating systems that help people or help himself, help other coaches coach at scale. And I think that I've learned a lot from him throughout the years. He is, uh, has many years of experience in agile coaching in the sales and marketing space specifically, which is really a unique place. And he brings a lot to uh, to the conversation. I'm really excited to have him talk to you tonight. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anthony. Thank you so much, Sid. And hi, everybody. If you would, um, if you're comfortable and, and you want to turn your camera on, I like looking at the screen and seeing everybody, but you don't have to. That's just because I like making eye contact with folks. So that's my style. That's my uh, my way of going. But the chat is great. I, I do have a time at the end just for Q&A, so we will have time for a lot of that. But I really do not mind being interrupted. So if you've got something that's like, wait a minute, you kind of went over that a little bit fast and I'm not sure I caught that or I have a question about that now. Can we just ask that question now? Yes, you can. So you can put in chat what the question is or you can um, raise your hand. And we and then one of the, the two ladies here will call on you and then I'll know to stop talking basically. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that they're here to help me moderate and it's just going to make it a lot easier. 
Um, I did include in the in the actual documentation that I had sent over that there were some some focus areas I wanted to talk about today, but we're not limited to that. So if you want to dive down a rabbit hole, yes, 100% great with that. I think the idea is that I, I wanted to have three big takeaways to master visualization tools and techniques that go beyond the traditional retrospective summaries because I have a, I'm going to ask a question about it, but I will just tell you my answer to the question before I ask it is, I think most agile retrospectives fail because they don't actually lead to change. I think they're a good place to gripe, they're a good place to share ideas in the team, but they don't scale and they, they fail because they don't lead to change. So I would like to talk about how I think there's a better way to do that Two, understand how to capture and aggregate, which means collect multiple teams feedback or multiple sets of feedback from the same teams over time to systematically um, export that data and then run it through a natural language processing tool, which I'm going to do a demonstration of tonight of how I do that. And then gate insights into using NLP with a, a generative AI to actually parse that data. Because any kind of feedback that you capture as verbatim text is data. And this is probably the first big idea for the night. If someone gives you feedback, that's data. Now we kind of understand that and just from a coaching standpoint, that's a data input, that's a source, that's a thought. But if you were to actually take, uh, you know, seven members, 10 members and take all of their feedback in the, if it's the three questions or however you do it, but you know, kind of the things that added value, things that didn't add value and what are we trying to pivot and learn and, and do better with, that's all text. And we want to capture that text and then understand it over time, not just week by week or sprint by sprint or iteration by iteration, but over a very long period of time to see what are the patterns, the trends, the anti patterns, what are the things that keep coming up that still aren't solved? What are the things we started talking about? We don't talk about it anymore because we now have elevated to this level and we've gone beyond. It's very helpful to understand if you leverage text data like that, and not just we had a retro, but if you actually think about how do we capture feedback and a retro is just one of the ways we're going to focus on tonight then you're going to be able to have a repository of knowledge, a repository of unstructured data. That's all verbatim text is. But with natural language processing in Gen AI, you're able to take thousands of lines of text and say, show me the patterns, the keywords, the tone, the sentiment. Let me start to understand the patterns and anti-patterns. Let, let me understand what the frequency is of that. And then you can generate some meaning from it, which is how you get an insight, right? Well, if we've heard this and we don't hear it anymore, do we have any data that would show us why we're not hearing it? Did they just give up and they don't want to complain about it anymore? Or did we actually do something about it and they don't need to talk about it anymore? As a leader, part of our job is to understand how do I know that? And so tonight, I hope that what we walk away with is some ideas and some practical things, including some free links I'm going to give away for you to try yourself and have fun with. But ultimately, I want you to leave asking better questions of your teams. And I want you to think about their feedback as a data point. All right. With that kind of introduction, I'll start sharing my screen in a second. But are there any questions or thoughts from either Samir or Sid before I begin? Nothing in the room. Or from anybody the in the audience? Okay. Anybody in the audience? Okay. Then I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's share. Uh, I'm going to put myself into presenter mode so that it's all nice and pretty. I've got dual screen, so I practiced this earlier and it should work just great, but you never know. So let's hit share and share screen. And I want to share that desktop. All right. You should see PowerPoint. Everybody got a PowerPoint on the screen? Yay. Right. Yeah. Don't you love it when a plan comes together? All right. So the idea is to take the idea of transforming feedback. How do we do it at scale? How do we coach better as a result of it? And I also want to teach you some AI pieces of it. Well, the first thing that I always want to talk about is the reason we capture these things together rather than in a just in a Slack channel somewhere or in a document somewhere. Um, I'm great with asynchronous work, but when it comes to gathering feedback, we need to have a place to, to visualize. But what did we capture? What does that look like? How does people feel seen, heard and valued from taking the time to give us the feedback? Um, I will be telling a couple of stories tonight about how we've done this at scale at IBM where I work, and I will just give you a little peak. One of the things that happened is after nine months of doing this, one of the biggest pieces was that the teams were able to see how their feedback led to change, notably, measurably. 
And two things happen when you when you make it visual. One, people give you more feedback. Why? Because you're actually doing something with it and it's worth their time to give it to you. It's not going into a black hole. And number two, they give you better quality feedback. Because when you start asking better questions, remember, one of the purposes for night, what you're going to get is the ability to then solicit even better answers from them. People generally know the answers if we're willing to take the time to help pull it out of them. We don't need to tell them what to do. They need to tell us what they need us to do. So we've got to make that psychologically safe. We've got to create that pattern um, of consistency, and we've got to show them the feedback that does lead to change. Best way I know to do that, visualize it, put it on the screen, talk about it, print it out, share it. So I like what Greg McKeon says in his book, Essentialism, and every set of facts, something essential is hidden. They may tell you a thing, but why that thing is there or what they motivated that thought usually isn't included. So if they give you a fact or a data point, you're going to want to, especially if it's during a thing like a retrospective or a stand-up, you're going to want to ask them, so what's informing that point of view? What makes you say that? Where, where's that coming from? Help me understand how you believe that to be true. Because I've not observed that, but I'm really interested in your point of view. It's those additional questions, those quote unquote soft skills, which I call essential skills, that really are at the heart of coaching is asking better questions and keep asking questions until you get to the place where you understand why that's a thing for them, why it's important. So I think that's a quick one. And I don't have that many slides because I wanted us to play instead of look. Um, the second thing is in the visualizing for awareness is to understand that not all work is equal. So when you start putting it up there and people go, oh, we need to do all this stuff. And you go, great, we have the bandwidth and resources for about a third of that. So what are we not going to do? So you're going to say no most of the time or not yet or um, not at this time or no, but we could do this instead. No is a very powerful thing, not for the person, but for the idea. We're not saying no to a person, we're saying no to an idea. And usually in context of in this moment. So you only say yes, maybe 10% of the time. This is the opposite of not only the companies I've worked for, but companies I've consulted with where my friends work when we talk about this. We're not good at saying no, we say yes, especially if it came from someone higher up in the organization. And that's a dangerous thing to do because I don't think the executives are right. Doesn't mean I think they're wrong, but by default, their position does not make them correct. So I want to ask them, well, what's motivating that decision? Why would we want to do that? Where's this ask coming from? How do we know? What's the data that supports that? And again, culture matters here. So if you have a really healthy culture, that's going to be really well received. If you have a very negative, toxic culture, that's not going to go so well, but at least you'll know something. And I still think that's valuable. I see a couple of chat things. Anything I need to be aware of? No, I was just noting uh, that Essentialism was an awesome book that people should check out. <laughs> it is a great book. So when we visualize a profound concept, we begin to think differently, see differently, and act differently. And a lot of the content that I share with my teams as I coach or when I do mentoring or when I present like this, I really want to drive home that thinking differently is key. And this came from my own personal therapy in life. Thinking differently was key. Um, the problem with me needing to be right, if you're an Enneagram person, I'm an Enneagram one. And if you're a Myers-Briggs person, I'm ENTJ. And if you're into StrengthsFinder, I'm com uh, command, a strategy, activator, relator, and communication. So a lot about me wants to be right. And you know what I learned? You can be right and be very alone. So what I had to realize was, A, I'm not always right. And even with my, if I'm right, the goal for me is not to be right. Why? Because if it's so important for me to be right, then someone else must be wrong. And that's not okay. So I'm not looking to make someone wrong so that I can feel right. Instead, I'm trying to say, what's the right thing for the situation? What do we do here? And how do we solicit that? Because we're all smarter than any one of us anyways. So just so you know, if you get people to think differently, then over time, behavior shift. Why am I pointing this out? Because coaches, your job is not to get them to change their behavior. And I know some of the coaching materials out there say it is. I'm telling you it's not. Why? Because as soon as you're gone, they will revert back to what doesn't work. Why? Because at least they know it and they're comfortable with it. Because compliance is an option. People will comply. You can make them. You can. It just doesn't stick once you've taken the, the observation or pressure away. But if you change someone's mind about something, their behaviors will follow change people's minds 
So have them think differently, see it differently, and they eventually they're going to act differently. The behaviors follow, they're not the point. Okay, a little bonus material for tonight. Um, I'm going to jump to the next one. The second thing I wanted to talk about is, and a visualizing for awareness, is this idea that comes from Galileo Galilei. And this is what he literally says on the screen. My translation of this is measure all your metrics and then measure the things you can understand. So if it's a number, it's really easy to measure, right? Clicks, attendance, velocity, story points. I mean, pick it. You can measure lots of stuff. But the, at the end of the day, you need to measure understanding. Well, Anthony, how do I measure understanding? Exactly. It's hard, isn't it? Because now you have to have a proxy measurement. You have to look at something that gives you an inference towards something, and that's a lot harder. So when someone gives feedback, is that a data point? Yes, we've already established it is. Can you measure it? Yes, you can. How, Anthony? It's a subjective statement. How do I measure a subjective statement? Because you can count the number of subjective, st subjective statements that have the same intent or tone or emotion behind them or the same keyword frequency. And if five people are complaining about the same thing or three people have the same great idea, that's not just an interesting coincidence. That's a data point. You can quantify that which is qualified. And that's one of the things I'm going to show you how to do tonight with some AI tools. So big one to kind of just hone in on. It's a big teaching point in this little session I've got. Let me get my mouse to wake up and I will continue. Any Anthony, questions, by the way? I have one comment in the chat that sure. I just wanted to tell you. Um, sure. So Max shared that another hard thing to measure most times is the customer value delivered. Oh, wow. Yes okay. and no. So here's how we do that. I actually, you're going to find in my templates that I'm going to share with you, I don't use the word what got done, what went well, what didn't go. I don't use that language. I use what added value and what didn't add value. Well, how do we know what's valuable? Well, we actually create North Stars that are the mission and vision for why this particular group of people are together. And when you do that and you have that clarity, then any goals the business has should align through that. And oh, by the way, if you create client-centric objectives, which are aspirational and inspirational ways to know, wouldn't it be great if, that's how I phrase them, wouldn't it be amazing if, what would happen if, and we talk about what's in it for those we're serving. When we do that, we go, okay, if we do this, we think it's going to be great for them, and it'll eventually lead to this numeric change that we want to see in the business, right? But the first thing you have to do is figure out, does it work for them? And I have a slide. I'll share it with you. Actually, I think I can probably just pop over. Do I have it in this other deck? I have two decks open, so I'm going to escape out just for a second. You're seeing something that I'm not intending to show because I didn't think about this ahead of time. But let me see if I have. I, I didn't think about showing this ahead of time, but I'm going to go ahead and pop it up on the screen. I hope you don't mind me kind of going off script a bit. I just feel like this is probably useful. Since follow what the he just flow. said. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I got to go with the flow. So let me and, pull up my uh, business yeah, agility. Uh, it's 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 Max here, and maybe I'm a little bit too passionate about customer value, but I just no I just no feel such thing. That is no such thing. No I such just thing. Feel that I don't hear enough about it in all the transformations and all the experiences I've had. So I get a bit like passionate about it so thank you for talking you and that. i both I, I i actually had i had a leader at one point say to me a manager say you're always about outcomes you and your outcomes and he wasn't complimentary and i was like yes that's actually the point man um because he was very much into outputs right did we do the thing and i go look if i took this whole group and said we're going to take a campaign to go clean up our neighborhoods and what we're going to do is pick up all the dog poop left in people's yards that people don't pick up from their dogs and then we're going to put it in these pretty brown bags and i've got a really good deal we got them on wholesale and they're organic and biodegradable biodegradable and we're going to roll them in this biodegradable glitter because i mean might as well be pretty could we get good and efficient at that yes should we no because making pretty dog poop packaged was never the goal but if someone said that's the goal a lot of people would get really good at that and i'm like but why are we even doing it that's the wrong thing to do so i don't actually want to get good at those things i want to create value if it's not valuable for those we serve it's not valuable now that could mean i work on something internally max to say to my teammates you know what would be great for our end users is if we did this we would have to retool internally to tie these to tie these two databases together and to fix this really bloated process this manual set of processes through automation but if we put our effort there, will it lead eventually to a better outcome for the client? Yes, then we should probably do that. 
Now, is it the most important thing? Maybe, maybe not, right? But value delivery has everything to do with those we serve and not just the business goals. So business goals are not why we're here. We're not. No business is in business to just make money anymore. Milton Friedman, economist, 1970-something said, I think 71, said, the only reason for a company to exist is generate a profit. Well, the 21st century has called, and they're like, you, you, we have a whole new way of thinking, right? And you've seen this with software as a service, and you've seen this with um, influencers, and you've really seen this with the advent of the internet, where the consumer became the one in power. The buyer has the power now, right? They own the customer journey. We don't own it. We can respond to it, and if you're not even doing that, then maybe you're reacting to it. But ultimately, the power dynamic shifted. So we're not, we're not here to primarily make somebody money who owns stock. We're primarily here to make sure our clients are successful. Because if they're not successful, we don't have income. If we don't have income, nobody gets paid, right? So if you just take it down to its natural thing, should you focus on value delivery? Of course, why? Because that's who pays your bills in the end, right? It's the tension to manage. Not a problem to solve, but this is something you've got to be aware. I have a whole model for this, which we can go into another time. I yeah. need to share my screen again. Yeah, Amen. share share the thing you want to share with us. <laughs> I'm trying to bring us back. Um, see, I told you I'd, I'd do this. Let me put this on the screen. Uh, I'm going to do it again. No, you're good. <laughs> this is something I actually teach inside IBM. And in a lot of cus customer situations, they say, we want to measure the number of new clients that we get. That's a new logo. We want to measure the customer satisfaction of those we have. We want to measure the customer retention. What's our churn rate? We want to measure, measure the NPS or customer referral, CSAT, whatever, and then lifetime value. Because lifetime value is the goose that laid the golden egg, right? So if someone just doesn't buy once, but buys again and buys more, that's where it's all at. And so most people measure those things. But if you read across the bottom there, that's what I focus on. It is 100%. All five of those are 100% flipped to be about the end user, 100%. And what it does is it informs us of how would we go ask what looks like to be successful them. I, I came from marketing and then sales. And you know what I think? I never sold a day in my life. Have I been in the sales role? Of course. I've been sales management. So how have I never sold a day in my life? Because all I do is help people solve problems. And if I can identify how to solve a problem in a way that gives them a better outcome, people, there, there's two things you need to know. If people value what you value and believe what you believe, it's shut up and take my money. Because like, you're, just take my money, right? If they value what you value, but don't yet believe, then you have a chance to convince and convert, right? If they don't do either, they shouldn't be your customer because they're going to be miserable and you're going to be miserable. So that's just a freebie. Didn't mean to go down that whole road too far, but let me come out of this show, go back to the other one. All right, that's just worth, uh, hopefully worth it for somebody somewhere. And I'm gonna keep moving because I'm watching the time. Sorry, Sid. Sid knows me. This is part of my- Okay, oh, it's all good. Is it my charm or my, or my weakness? Um, you decide. All right, here we go. The principal priority states you must know the difference between what's urgent and what's important. I use an Eisenhower matrix. If it's urgent and important, we stop everything and do it now. Very few things should be there. If it's important, but not urgent, then we're going to prioritize it in our backlog. If it is urgent, but it's not important to me or my team, I will delegate to someone else. And if it's neither, we just say no. No, 90% of the time is a real thing. You can do this. And if you haven't read this book, Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art, oh my gosh, get this book. Yeah. Phenomenal. I agree. Phenomenal book. Yeah. Also a good All right, let's keep let's keep going. So I teach on the art of subtraction. Now, I'm a little bit of a nerd. So I was never really good at all the maths, but um, I like the idea of what's called the order of operation from middle school, where you had to do the work inside the parentheses first. So if if you have high value work and you take the time to subtract, know what's not working, ask the team, how is it going? How do you get rid of the low value work? As much as you can mitigate or eliminate. Then when you multiply, that's code for scaling, with extensible and automation, so things that can talk to each other through API, for example, eliminating manual processes, eliminating redundant processes, <clears throat> too many meetings. If you can do that, guess what? You will get better outcomes. There's a scientific formula for this. Yes, I came up with it, but that's not the point. The point is, is this mathematically works. Here's the problem if you don't. If you have a plus sign there, then when you scale, you will scale high value work and all the low value work. That's a problem because now you made a whole lot more low value work. If you scale manual processes, that's a problem. You made it a lot worse, right? So this is a really easy thing I find to be very helpful. We're almost done with the PowerPoint. So that's artist subtraction. 
And I like Greg McKeown's thing, Steve Dinning, and Hans has a really good one too. So I won't read the screen to you because you can all read, but I think it's pretty noteworthy stuff. Almost done with that. Um, last thing is if you stick to the vision, you align to the mission. So remember I said North Stars, that's mission and vision. So if your team's doing a retro and you're saying, what did we accomplish and how well did that go? If your team's doing a planning session, you should be able to say, does this help us accomplish the mission and vision we agreed to together? And if the answer is no, but an executive wants it, you say, then do we have to do it? And you question it and someone takes that and goes and pushes that up the, up the chain. And you can do this with data, quantitatively measured qualitative feedback coming up in just a moment here. We'll show you how to do it, right? Andy Stanley is a guy I follow. We don't drift in good directions. We discipline and prioritize ourselves, prioritize ourselves there. I love that quote. Um, Kim Scott, Radical Candor, another great book, just because I love throwing great books in there, because if you haven't read these, you're welcome. They're amazing. Um, yeah, so you got to figure it out. So this was a real situation I had, and I just used as an example, because again, sales and marketing, right? This was the actual map. Anybody see potential for confusion for the teams doing the work, trying to serve all of them? Because I do. It was not clear where to go. So lack of organizational clarity is important to visualize. That way you can say, but, but why are we doing this? Is this, for, is this for them or for them? Or what happens if we don't do this? Or if we don't do this, does that affect these people? It starts getting to the place where you can ask more intelligent questions and your team understands why they're prioritizing something, not because someone said so. Hugely valuable. Um, I like to highlight dissonance and represent courageous feedback. So when someone's willing to say this sucks, I go great on the journey to not sucking at all. How do we suck a little less? Because if you suck a little less, less next week, that's winning, right? On the journey to not sucking at all, sucking a little bit less each iteration is a form of winning, right? And if people see you starting to suck less and the stuff they have to do sucks less, that's good because you probably can't solve it all overnight, but if it could suck a little less, that'd be great. So I actually call that a win. And we, we talk about that and joke about that, but we, we take it seriously. So what I want to know is what is the feedback? Aggregate that. I like word clouds for this. Uh, if you have an NPS or a CSCAT and let people know their feedback matters. I talk and Sid can have vouch for this because she's been around me. I talk to them blue in the face about tell us what you really think. Tell us what you really need. Tell us how this is actually going. And we really want them to be, sometimes they're brutally honest, but I would prefer that rather than hemming and hawing around the thing. So, all right. I like, last one, I just left it in there. This is visualizing causality. There are multiple ways to get to causality. A lot of it is correlation in the meantime. So you got to figure out what are you trying to understand, an individuated thing or a whole? Is it analysis? Can you get the synthesis? Do you have isolation? Can you build relationships? Do you have silos? Can there be emergence, right? These are all things that as a coach, you're trying to think about how do I go from the left to the right? How do I go from the black to the blue there? What would that look like? And I think you'll see that the results which shape the future actions lead to better results or change will shape future feedback, which leads to change, which will face, you know, that those are infinite loops of value. Any thoughts, questions, comments before I jump into the actual meat of this? Because this is just to, like to get the concept shared. Nothing in we chat. Good? Nothing in chat. Then I can pop back out and we'll go over here. All right. So I'm going to take you into Mural. I'm going to share this um, um, into chat myself. If I click this button, great and hit paste. This is a free link everybody can use. Yeah, you don't have to do it right now, but it lets you build your own retrospective radar if you have a Mural account. I am building one for Mural. I've been saying that for months. I just haven't finished it because prioritization, right? But um, I, I really like being able to visualize things in a, in a tool that anybody can use. And I give this away freely because I want this to be something everybody uses. I think it's an infinitely better, uh, measurably better retrospective model. Um, so what it looks like, if you if you want to see it up close, and this is our agenda for tonight, this is the retrospective radar, this is how this whole thing works, and you'll notice that what I've done is I've set this up so that we can play together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, Apple, uh, nope, that's not what I wanted, I'll share that in a second. Somehow I completely closed Safari. That's always fun. Let's reload that. Okay. Um, yeah, we're good. And then I want to undo those so those can move. Great. And then let's lock it all. Great. I'm going to share this to chat and hopefully everybody 
can get to the SID. This is where I've had problems. I am on the um, IBM version still, but hoping it might work here. Yeah. At the very least you can view, I'm gonna try that. And then I also got it in my, so if you'll all click on that link, I'll at least walk you through it together. Um, and I can show you exactly how this works. It does have an outline, which basically just lets you go uh, to each area of the mural just by clicking. It's just a nice little zoom. Um, I will start up here at the foundation so that I can explain it, and then I'm going to get rid of this. So how many of you are, for, you are familiar by thumbs up or, or uh, saying hello or however you want to do it with your nodding? How many of you are familiar with Stephen Covey's circles of control, influence, and concern? Anybody? couple people any thumbs up in here don't see a couple okay yeah for those who are not it was an idea to say if the if it's in the middle you control it if you can't control it can you or someone in your sphere influence it and if you can't do either are you just concerned about it and can somebody know about that who can we tell that we can't influence it but we can't control it, but maybe somebody could help us with it well i like that a lot and i've been teaching that for years and then i heard about a guy named pat kua who created the starfish for retrospectives and his idea was when the team finished a retro they would say hey so what are we a team going to start doing stop doing do less of keep doing or do more of and i thought it was a super great way to take retros to the next level but because i had this whole prioritization thing of but to who because the team can start doing but what if the manager needs to start doing what if the manager can't influence it so a senior executive needs to start something how would you know so I created the retrospective radar and the retrospective radar is very simple circle of controls in the middle. So if the team puts a sticky note here, they want to do more of this because that's working well. If they put it and start doing the team is choosing right, but if it comes over here to yellow, then that means they're asking their manager or our executive above them, whatever to influence this thing they want to start doing that they can't do maybe somebody else could or if it makes it to the orange what's something that the, uh, the manager or the team can elevate up what what does the exec leader need to know about it and so we created this really simple way of saying if we could put the stickies in this area now not only do i know your intention start stop keep doing more of less of i now know who it's for for the team for the managers or for the executives or somebody somewhere who can solve right so I thought it was pretty helpful. So I kept the basic function of the three questions kind of thing. But again, I don't believe in the what did you do? How did that go? I believe in the what added value because I'm all about value max. So what added value goes here? What did not add value here? And what are some new and improved ideas? Those go here. So if you're able to, and I don't know, can any of you grab these and drag them or are you not allowed? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Thing. Okay, no, I'm going to try one more visiting, thing. We can, just, we can only watch. So I'm going to try one more thing. If so, I sign in, I could edit, but I'm, I'm doing it as a visitor. So. Yeah, one second. Yeah, and the problem is I'm on, this is the IBM one I was using to see if I could get people in, but I'm now going to go to my personal one. Give me a sec. And murals. All right, here we go. I go to this one. I'm going to share this screen over. Let's see if you can get into this one. Because there's more than one way, right? There's more than one way. This is going to be in Chrome, which is fine. If I share, if I share that and I hit anyone with the link. Nope. See, so said I'm still stuck and I don't know how to solve that. Yeah. So I apologize. Okay. All right. Well, it was worth worth the effort. Well, let me just demonstrate for the sake in chat, if you would, um, or open your mic up and tell me something that added value this week for one of your teams or for you leading teams. And what I will do is I will transcribe a few things down quickly just so you can see how it works, because this will at least be better than nothing. So give me something. Just open a mic up. Tell me something that went well, um, that added value specifically for something y'all did at work this week. Anybody? Uh, reviewed roles and responsibilities to reduce double work. I like that. Hey, who else has one? Um, I paired with a colleague to build better. Build what better? The thing we were working on. <laughs> 
Okay, that's good. Okay, who else? What added value to specifically well, something that that helped you serve those your your task with serving better? Yeah, um, so created a, a working session with a team um, to scale up the knowledge on the product. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Any other thoughts around that worth sharing? Is there a specific aspect of it that the team would benefit from knowing about or another similar team would be benefit from knowing about? Yeah, so what happened is we have like um, 10 new members which are supposed to be taken over from like the old teams on a product. Okay. And while they're waiting, you know, um, presently right now, they're, they're sort of learning. So we're sort of creating a session for us to learn. And um, we have something called like a skills metrics where we're trying to, um, we've broken down the applications or the products into different modules. And we're getting them to rank their competency level on each of the modules, right? So as soon as we've done that, we are now getting SMEs to come in and, you know, just help them um, get up to speed with the actual, you know, what's it called, module they're working on. So it's prioritizing the modules and getting an SME um, to sort of help okay. them ramp up okay. uh, the knowledge. Yep. Thank you. So these two are clearly related. So I'm going to put, I'm going to group those two together. These two are a little bit different. Anybody got anything else I can throw in or something that did not add value? Something that you're like, yeah, that could have gone a lot better. That you feel free to share that you can talk about. Something that added value was canceling meetings that didn't have quorum. Actually, our European partners are on holiday this week, so it would have just been a few and not mm. a good use of people's time. Good. So you freed people's time. Anything that didn't add some value uh, for anybody on the call? And if you want to put stuff into chat, then they can read them to me. It's fine. Free reads that did not go out before the meeting. So made for a very, very long meeting today. Okay. Any other things could have gone better? That was like, that's a low value amount of effort. I'm not even sure why we had to do that because we have those and I, I have, I have people call them out all the time. I don't know. I had to have a meeting about an invite list. Like who was okay. invited to a meeting, like a whole meeting just to discuss who was going to be invited to a meeting. A meeting about a meeting. <laughs> oh my God. I know. That, this should have been an email. All right. Yeah. Anybody else got something? So I've got meetings as a kind of a theme here. Any others? Things that from your teams you heard about could have gone better? I met with the team to uh, expand the scope of a report that isn't getting feedback at all. So that's a good thing or a bad thing? Bad thing. Creating more work without uh, Oh, oh, from a report. So got it. I I'm, I'm misunderstood. Yeah, that's scope creep is <laughs> always challenging. Uh, anybody else got anything? Starting development work on a design that wasn't approved. Ooh. So how did it get, how did it get started if it wasn't approved? I have to ask that question. Totally. So uh, the first green sticky that you wrote. Uh-huh. So basically, so uh, there was not a good enough process. So something happened that shouldn't have happened. He cooks in the kitchen. Got it. Yeah, totally fair. Right. And so we have too many cooks in the kitchen. Right. If I can cons. Well, there's that too. <laughs> That's a different cultural issue. Um, we'll keep those two together. Right. So, so you can start to see as the team does this and, and I typically have it where they put their first and last initials or their first name. If you have nobody has the same first name on the team in here, just so that we know who said it. Um, you can do this anonymously as well. What I find is when you have a really high EQ team where you've got a great team agreement or social contract, the anonymity actually gets in the way of building the trust. So if we know who said what, we can act on it and let them know that their feedback led to change. It's actually a good thing because I'm trying to level that playing field as a leader. And then what are some new and improved ideas that came out of y'all's call? So obviously we reduced redundancy, so we improved processes to remove a redundancy. That's good. What else happened this week that's worth sharing? Um, something that the team needs to implement. 
Anybody? Just asking about your work week last week. How'd it go? What are things that could have gone? Regular hmm? things leadership, just to make sure we're on the track, on par. Okay, so how often is regular? What's your cadence? Uh, Bi-weekly. Okay, great. Anybody else got one or two? New SME added to the team. That was really valuable. Great. And what's the action that we need to take from that? Do we need to onboard him? He, it's in reverse. He's onboarding us and helping us with compliance. Oh, so compliance training needed. Great. So you're going to have some training coming up. Great. So this is a basic concept, right? You guys understand how retros go. Well, what would happen now is we would basically start with the new and improved ideas. And I would duplicate these because I like leaving them there just for context. The color code helps with that too. But ultimately, I would say, hmm, this is something, and I'm going to zoom in so you can see, improve process to reduce redundancies. We need to start that because we figured out there was a missing process. We need regular syncs. We need to start doing regular syncs with leadership. You know who I need my help with? I need the manager to help with that because uh, we as a team member may not get that calendar time. And a new SME is added, compliance training is needed, so we need to start doing that. So we've got a bunch of stuff in the start doing category so far. Let's go over here. Is there anything we would want to take from this and say, do less of or stop doing? Uh, this would be one. I'm reading about the invite list. Uh, yeah, this is one. Uh, Pre-reads, yeah, meeting about, yeah, yep. We should stop all of these, frankly. I mean, I'm just gonna go ahead and, right? So if I, if I take all these and I just zoom out, I'm gonna go real quick. All right, I won't take, whoops, those four. If I can click, there we go. And I'm gonna stop doing all those. And maybe we just do less of, um, pre-reads you know it's not going to always be perfect but we got if we sucked a little less it'd be better right maybe that could be you know better agendas you know might be another one we need to do agendas for meetings right and then you might want to do more of that so the idea is that the team chooses themselves what goes where because it's their own prioritization oh how many of you by the way by uh, th thumbs up raise your hands whatever how many of you have your planning meeting whether it's sprint planning iteration planning whatever immediately following or the very next day after a retro anybody because i do got one person okay how far apart do you have your planning from your retros please open your mics or to put it in chat i'm very curious a business day or less okay anybody else Anybody? Do you do retrospectives? No, same <laughs> do you as you. I was just on girl instead of this page. <laughs> oh, sorry. So within a day, within 24 hours, okay, does anybody not take time to do reflection with their teams yet? What we would call a retrospective is one term for that, but it's just a reflection of how things are going. Do you do that weekly, biweekly, monthly, quarterly? Please open your mics and share or put it in chat. Really want to know how to best serve you tonight. Bi-weekly. Anybody? Bi-weekly? Okay. So whatever that cadence is, if you don't have a way to capture this, it's really hard to, to do much with it. So what I would do is I would take all of this, right, and I would color code them. I'm not going to do it right now. And I, I figured out an easy way, all kind of red to yellow. That means it's in circle of concern. That's for the senior leaders. If it's bluish, it's in circle of influence. That's for the managers. And I just turn all of these to one color because the team's self-prioritizing. It's not a feedback loop in the middle. That, that is just prioritization. Feedback is the outer two rings, right? So now if I have that and I convert those, guess what I can do? Mural, and I am poking on one tool, lets me download these. And I could say, I wanna download just this as a CSV file. And I hit download. And guess what? If I come over here to my downloads folder, Sid, give me a time check real quick. It's seven o'clock. We've got another 30 minutes or so. Great, perfect. Um, let me open this with Excel. Anthony, while you're opening that, just two comments from the chat on the frequency. Uh, Lori shared that every other sprint, and then Anne-Marie said once per sprint. Got it. 
So this is the export of what we just did. Now, if I had matched those background colors, I could tell you which segment and which circle. This is from start doing team. This could be stop doing manager, right? That's how, that's what those are useful for. Does that hex code make sense now that I show it to you over here? Do you understand how by mapping the color when you get the export, you're able to actually see how that works? Because yeah, you're, that's, ta I think, you're tagging it with the hex code color as a label. Correct. And that's all I'm doing. If I put it back on the screen, sorry, I didn't mean to drag it off. Um, whoops. Uh, if I click this, yeah, I'm just tagging it so I can know what it was. Why? Because I built a, with, with somebody's help, I built a, a actual Excel spreadsheet of pivot tables, right? Where we do the data import here on this tab, but once we just take the text and paste it in and we do it by date and by team. So I would take every team. So I had 26 teams when I did this, this is real data. I'll, all I've done, just be clear is I've turned it into lorem ipsum so that it's, I can share it, you know, so it's, it's not private data. But these are, this is 20, I also renamed the teams, 26 teams, managers would have multiple teams. So they might be all AI apps or all automation, same manager, but different teams. And so what we have is the ability to say, what is the total number of things in circle of concern? That's what goes to the senior leaders. Hey, can you change it? So we don't have to use this database anymore. It's all manual and things that I can influence. Hey, can my manager please set up a bi weekly meeting with a leader? That's a managed circle of influence. So if you're a manager, you want to see your team, you go circle of influence, and I'm going to choose AI apps because those are my three teams. And I can see one team's giving me a ton of feedback and two are barely giving me any. I can also see what the segments are. Most of the feedback has been in less of. Anthony's translation, hey, stop the stupid. This is, this sucks. <laughs> this stop, we need to stop that. Next highest value, start doing. Anthony's translation, hey, you know that stupid thing I asked us to stop? Here's how to make that better right but until and unless you capture this where does it go how do you act on it right the retro typically just stops right there and i'm trying to make it live on i'm trying to use it as a data point so now when i do this against all the teams all 26 teams and i want to see what all managers are doing i can see that if i want to see what percentage of the feedback was for managers roughly 30 about five uh, 66 percent what feedback was for the senior executives about 34 percent Right. So and then by segment, same basic structure. But then we did something else because each manager would go in and say, did we do this? Well, we didn't start these. These ideas are under consideration. This many are in progress. These were kind of longer term. We're working on it. We have escalated these. We don't have a solution for you yet. I don't know what you're asking for. Please give me more context or completed or no, we're not going to do that. Or that's a duplicate. We've got that covered. And this is literally the data from all of that verbatim text that tells us what's been acted upon. So remember at the very beginning of the call when I said that if people, if you will act on the data, if they can think differently, see visually uh, differently, right? They'll eventually behave differently. Why would they behave differently? Because they found out that someone's listening. They feel, they feel seen, heard, and valued. So when they feel seen, heard, and valued, guess what happens? They give you more feedback because it's worth the time. And you're probably going to act on it. These are real percentages, by the way. This really happened. So I've got the ability to then look at that in a lot of dimensions. But I also have the ability to parse by team, by date, by circle, by segment, right? So this is super easy. Are we not? Am I not sharing my screen? I want to make sure I'm sharing the screen still. I still, I do. See your screen. You see, a, you see it. You see an yeah, Excel spreadsheet that I'm showing you, right? Okay, making yes. sure. Okay, if you're looking at Mural, you're in Mural on yeah. your browser, but in Zoom, there is a spreadsheet. Yeah. So Matt, if you go to Zoom, you'll see the spreadsheet on the, that I'm sharing. Any thoughts or questions about this? Because this is a lot to take in, and I knew I had a lot. We're going to go have some fun with some AI tools next, but I just wanted to make sure that I laid the groundwork for how this all works. Because my point is for you to go try this. I want you to figure out how do you make retros lead to change, feedback lead to change in your organization. That's my, that's my motive. My secret scheme to take over the world. <laughs> Anybody, questions, comments, feedback so far? Regina, very cool. Just a comment. I, I, you said it was 26 teams. I think, you know, when you're dealing with one or two teams and, and you're doing retrospective, it's a very, I think that's a very helpful tool. 
Now you think about processing the data at scale for a, a larger organization, and that's mm -hmm. a completely different level of agile coaching. So people may be dealing with different you know, types of agile coaching. Maybe you're doing more team coaching. Maybe you're doing more enterprise coaching. I see the the actual um, Excel and the the processing of the data more as a an uh, enterprise level coaching tool. Maybe, but if you did this, for, like here's our meeting. I just took uh, the text that came out of that Excel spreadsheet, right, which came from right off a of mural. Right. And I just pasted it in and already I'm going to be able to see keywords and the frequency of those keywords. I'm yes, going to see I concepts point is when it's just a uh, two teams, you could probably just do it in your head. You do it. In your, yeah, you do it in yes. your head. Yeah, you don't need a spreadsheet for it, but you can only do it in your head. Yes. When you have a few sorts of data, yeah. if you have two years worth of data, you're not doing oh, that in your head. For sure. For sure. Right. And I think we're in this for the long game. We're not trying to make is the team faster. That's never the goal. Yeah. Will they get faster if they get better? Of course. But the um, point wasn't to be faster. Anthony, we question for you. In, uh, comment, uh, sorry, in chat. Sorry, go ahead. Sure. Go ahead yeah, how long does it take the, to add the data to the Excel file after each cycle of feedback? I, that's a really good question. Um, so you watch me do the export in real time. So uh, Patrick, it, it's super easy to do the exports. I had those all go to a folder. And then I just had a script. Um, it's just Visual Basic for Excel, right? Because I didn't have a better tool at the time. Um, I'm not using this anymore. I have a much better system now. But, but, um, but I just had a script that imported every CSV, or excuse me, yeah, CSV file from that, and then it looked at the hex code and translated into uh, segment and circle automatically. And it took the text and it and I and I named the file with the team name. So. I, the naming of the files took me some manual time. Everything else was a fast download. I did the script to upload it. I mean, per month when I, cause I did this every two weeks, 45 minutes, maybe 30, 45 minutes. It wasn't much. Well, it, that's not a lot of work um, for the amount of insight I get, right? So that was, and, and I, do, I do it that one time. I will share one more thing with you on the screen before we do dive into this. We actually, captured this and um, turned it into feedback at scale. So we would take, oh, sorry, I've got to re-log in apparently. <clears throat> My apologies. Sure, it's been three hours since you were here, so of course you Yeah, have you know, so <laughs> it's, yeah. And plus I closed the browser accidentally. So one of the things we did is how does agile sales um, squad feedback lead to change? Because remember, that's the whole point. It's not, do we do more retros or better retros? Well, we use the retrospective radar and we took it and aggregated. So I was able to see for a snapshot, you know, this is a particular snapshot, um, how many sticky notes were the team prioritizing? 26 teams, 806 stickies. How many of them were circle of influence start doing? Hey, managers start doing this, 25 stickies. How many were for senior leaders start doing 16? How many were senior leaders stop doing nine, right? So I counted total number of stickies as a good proxy measurement. Then I would show that change over 90 days. And my goal was always to get this number in green the highest because I wanted the vast majority of it is we're doing such a good job of acting on your feedback. You just self prioritize and go. You don't need permission. You don't need help. That's what was always the goal. So we took the text though, and I'm about to show you this and, and would then parse it and say, what are the concepts? What are the keywords? What's the emotion? What's the sentiment? And what you'll notice here is I actually, whoops, I actually pasted it in. So I would say, here's what Watson natural language processing said. This was the emotion score. This was the sentiment. This is real data, right? And so we would then say, and what needs to change? And how long is it going to take to change? And what does that look like? So we would do this. Pardon me. We would do this and have all of this data just run through this. Now, again, Sid's right. A couple of teams, you don't need all this work. But if you're trying to do it over a long period of time or with a lot of teams, this is how you scale feedback. This is how you aggregate and scale feedback. And now I didn't just have a complaint about something. I actually had a data point. So when you get a team doing this at scale, this is what we used to use, right? I would have all of this text, change into those colors, export them, and then that's how they got into the spreadsheet. We come back to that right here. And that's how those got in here. And it would just let me automatically import, and now I know which team, what date, uh, circle of influence segment, and the actual text. And then if we completed it or not, or had it started, that's what was set manually by the person, each manager, you know, responsible per team. So that's how that worked. 
So just as an idea, this is just one visualization. And my point isn't to teach you how to do one visualization. The idea is how do we get better at thinking about does when a team gives me feedback, do we act on it? And if so, where does the team act on it? Do I act on it? Does a manager act on it? Does an executive, does a product owner, who needs to act on it? Because now I have that categorization and segmentation all in one. Yes, Lori. I see Lori on the screen, so I was assuming she was going to have something to say there. Did you come unmuted, Lori? Um, I must have, but I don't have a comment. Oh, okay. You're fine. Thank you. You're welcome. We had another comment from Kaylee in the chat about that they, um, Kaylee's used radar, starfish, and circle of influence, but never all three together. So love that combination. Yeah, it's it's super cool. And I went to Pat Kua just for full disclosure and said, hey, I really like your starfish, but I have this idea. Can I use your starfish? This was like, totally, man, let's make it all better. Um, I took this to, this is kind of like, I get to pat myself on the back a little bit. It's not about that. It's a cool moment for me. I don't put people on pedestals, but I can still think some people are pretty amazing. Two of those people um, are Diana Larson and Esther Derby, who wrote the book on retrospectives. And when I sat down with Esther and went through this the first time, she was like, you've made retrospectives better forever. And I was like, can I quote you? Because that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so um, that was a neat moment for me. Um, any questions, thought, or feedback? Because I really, we can go into the Gen AI piece. We can go into the natural language processing piece. I just don't know what would benefit this group the most. So I'm, I'm opening it up to you tell me what you want to do. Yeah, what questions do you have? And I know I like drink, it's like drinking from a fire hose in these kind of situations. So I almost want to apologize, except it's kind of necessary for me to do it this way. I, I hope I've not totally overwhelmed everybody. I hope that what you're getting is some takeaways that are practical. You have a retrospective radar mural template. You have the idea of how to do exports and you have the idea that all feedback can be data. So if you'll think about it, those three things and you walk out of, way, out of here with that, we've been successful in my opinion. But how else can I help your teams? How can I help you? Um, I accidentally closed the session when you were going to the natural processing language. Would you mind reshow? Like, how did yeah, you yeah. export yeah, yeah. it and get in there? Happy to. Yeah, no problem. Let me go back. So remember the Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to pull it back up here. Uh, window. Agile Austin. So I took the text that we pulled off that spreadsheet right here. I literally just copied the text. So, I mean, there's just nothing to it. That's just a literal grab that column, grab those, hit copy. And then I went over to what's well, a natural language processor. I do work for IBM. This is a free tool for people, so you can use can it too. Can anybody sign up for it, Anthony? You or sure can. Yeah, you can yeah. do it. Any, anybody can. So if you want to do this, you know, you just hit paste, analyze text, and it's going to go through and analyze this. This link right here, I will put into chat so that everybody has it. This is free. You might have to have a W, like an IBM. You do not. You, you do don't? not. This is IBM.com. Anybody cool. can do this because it's a demo. They they have a example for legal, financial, media. So here's media. If I analyze oh. their pre-done text, right? These are the concepts. These are the relationships, right? That they found. Uh, there was an attribute to one of them. This is the percentages, right? How likely you were to see these things. What was important? Uh, how would you classify it? Um, was it positive, neutral, or negative? So it gives you a lot of data that may be more than some of you want. You can do this with Google um, uh, natural language processing. There are several free ones out there. Almost all of them require you to give you a credit card in order to just use it because they do want you to end up buying it. This one's free. So that's why I, I use it all the time. So I drink our Kool-Aid, but I also do it because it's free. I work free. at IBM <laughs> as well, but I did not realize this existed. So I learned something also. <laughs> yeah. So that's how Kaylee was just by putting it in there, then I can parse that out. And what I was showing here was that I, I actually pasted it onto this W3 page internal for IBM, right? So that internally I could share this with our teams and show them what's happening. And just full disclosure, people give seven times more negative feedback than positive feedback, generally speaking. Now, 
that's just human nature. But when you start to solicit feedback, remember what added value, what not at, didn't add value? Those two questions give you a lot higher percentage of valuable positive sentiment than you would if you just asked people to give feedback because they almost always complain, right? So I never thought we could get this to a positive, but I sure thought given enough time we could get it to neutral especially because of one, I'm gonna tell a quick story here. One of the things that was super cool was I actually had a team that everybody knew it was a problem that this sales tool and this sales tool, two big ones you would know the names of both of them, um, didn't talk to each other, but they had to use both of them. So there was a lot of double data entry and everybody knew about this, but it was like, it's not that hard, export to Excel, do an import, how hard can it be? Well, it turns out it was a problem and it turns out that for the 26 teams I had, it averaged um, several hours per week per person and they weren't selling during that time. So it impacted their ability to actually do their job. And no one realized it took that much time until we started seeing this pattern and trend come up in the feedback. And so I said, hey, for a week, capture how often this happens. And they all gave me this data. Guess what I was able to do? I was able to go back and say, for this small $20,000 or whatever, we can write an API script and get this thing solved in like one or two weeks or this many comma, comma, comma dollar signs, right? We're gonna keep spending on wasted productivity. Once the leaders saw that it was quantified and there was an impact, they were like, why would we not fix that? Exactly. Because until we had data to tell the story, they didn't know it was that big a problem. Right. Another story that's true, I had a team that we had a homegrown tool that we sold to uh, telcos and this telco had to basically wanted to order this very low cost product. They would fill out the information, it would invoice them, they would be able to pay it, they would be able to download it and install it. It was all nice and easy, except there was a bug. Everybody knew there was a bug, but it was thought it didn't happen often. Guess what? Turns out it started happening more often. A team on their own figured out how often, figured out how long, and guess what they did? They solved it in three weeks. Well four weeks worth of capturing data, like three and a half, and then three weeks after that. So I guess a total of six, seven weeks, and they never had the problem again. And that was millions of dollars of billable work, right? So like, this is a big deal. So when you think about it, if you'll do a business impact from just asking better questions, you know I have data to make that case. Because this verbatim feedback is data. It is hailing here. I don't know if you can hear that through my microphone. I can, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have hail. It left so. here and came to you. Wow. Mm -hmm. So and that's a, a real story. Um, yes, I know we're coming down to the end of time, but I know mm -hmm. some of the things that you said that are really resonating with me. So I, I do think it was kind of water from a fire hose, but any kind of educational session, I'm not trying to absorb everything. I'm trying to think of just a few, like three sparks that I can take away this week and try out because what could happen, but I learned. Um, I really liked, so I've seen all the, the technology element, but I also really liked how you brought the human element into this. Um, I liked what you said about you can be right, but you can be alone. And the process of creating this with people was really important to bring them on the journey. So they were part of it. Um, focusing in on the resource match, like the top 10% of opportunities. I find I encounter that with a lot with teams. Everybody has ideas, but actually which are the ideas we're gonna get the most impact from that we, we can actually solve. So that's where the tools you showed, I think were really helpful. Um, and then the books so that you shared, I think were, it's a good reminder of continuing to learn from different sources. I love webinars, I love podcasts, but I also need to sit down with books. And uh, several that you mentioned, I added to my Amazon uh, by next. So thank you for that. Anybody else want to share any, what, what sparked for you that you're going to take away tonight? And I like calling on names. It's a terrible habit of mine. So I might check in with three people. Maybe somebody would like um, to share something. So maybe Stephanie, uh, Jerome, or Peter. Is there, is there one? Or anybody else that also wants to open their mic, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Regina, I will add some of those books. Maybe. Anybody? Thoughts? Because I honestly, I want to learn. So if there's something that I didn't cover or covered too fast or didn't give you enough detail on, please share that too. I like um, how you gave the example on how you're doing the retro, just the idea of not just using the standard what went well, what didn't go well, right? Instead, you're asking like, how did we add value? Um, I've never thought about it from that perspective or thought to, you know, do that instead of just the default. And so to me, that is 
it's a it's a it's immediately a mindset change when you're asking it in how did we add value that just feels like it just hits differently and it's more intentional so i think that that's much more impactful than at least how my team's been doing their retros so i, I like that as a takeaway yeah. for, for me yeah for me i'd like to say thank you you know the the retro really changed um you know my my thought process and Again, I'll piggyback on what was said earlier about you can be right, but be alone. I've seen a lot of transformation leaders come in and say, you know, this is the way we have to do it, you know, without understanding why folks are doing the, you know, doing things the way they are, you know, trying to enforce things and, you know, forgetting that immediately they're gone, folks are going to go back to their old behaviors, right? So um, letting folks learn and be themselves, I think, you know, it's a good thing, you know, that I've learned out of all of this, you know, it's trying to push things and try to be right and, you know, still be alone. I think, you know, it's good for the teams to learn and understand why they're doing things and just progress um, as they move along. So not not enforcing, you know, on your, your, your way of thinking on people just because you think is right. You want to make sure everybody does it your way and, you know, um, right. pushing it back. And um, because the, before you know it, they're back to the old ways again, right? Because you're not going to be there for for the entirety or another five years, 10 years. <laughs> so it's just a short term fix. Um, you know, Always. Yeah. So um, I, I did like that. Thank you. It's like, thank you. It's like Nanny McPhee or um, or Mary Poppins, right? When, when you first start as a coach, you're not wanted, but you're needed. But by the time they want you and no longer need you, that's when you should leave. Right. It's it's not a long term gig. Um, you're always moving to the next group of people. And now you can it, I have a roadmap five years, like minimum five to seven years to get us to where we need to be. Um, so it's not a short little stint that I've got. But even I have moved around inside IBM doing this because it's it's impossible. It's impossible for you to get through to everybody the same way. They're going to need a different voice. They're going to need a different way to think. What you want to leave them with is the, not just a best practice, but a best way to think. Right. What's the best way I can rethink about this? What's the best question I can ask? If you can help them do that, oh my gosh, when you leave, even if they're still on a journey, you've equipped them for how to go on the journey. That's the way. And I think the idea there is vision and principles, value and principles that you get from the Agile Manifesto make that very clear. So um, yeah, those are my thoughts for tonight. That's awesome. Anthony, there's one more comment in the chat uh, from Anne-Marie. She said that uh, they said that they love the data-driven coaching approach and asking better questions, listening uh, to the team feedback, and then having actionable data. Well, awesome. throw out your feedback is data. I'll definitely steal that line. Um, I haven't, I've focused on making things actionable in the short term, but I haven't focused a lot on showing the trends long-term. And I really like using the, natural language processing to gather sentiment. So definitely got lots of new ideas. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm definitely taking that away as well, Anthony. You know, we, uh, we've we been working together for a long time. You are a cherished friend, but you're also such a great influence. And I love um, the way you think through things and the, the systems that you build that do help us work at scale because it is one of the bigger challenges I think that we have and I just want to thank you for that you're uh, an awesome friend I love you Sid I do I love Sid I've loved her working <laughs> with her she's been she's a good friend so thanks for having me if I get to come back and I'd like to so this is me making a pitch I actually created a way to say if the business wants this I call it the outcome driven alignment model and I've put it on LinkedIn so you can see about it there but it's the idea of if this is what the business wants and this is what the clients wants how do we balance the the tension how do you do that and I have a way of doing that so I'd like to uh I'd like to um offer to come back and teach that sometime because I All think right. it's a game changer let's do it let's let's make that a plan make that a plan um I do before we break I would like to just do a little plug for next month so again the first Monday of May next month we're going to have um Aaron Randall and Carrie Sudi for those of you who know those two wonderful people. Um, they're going to come and talk about transformative transformative leadership. Um, and it's a preview of a, of a talk they're doing at another conference. So they're going to come do that for us first and, and walk through that. And we're really excited to have them. And, you know, I thank 
the people who come to talk. Anthony, I'm really grateful to you. I'm grateful to the people who come and, and share their wisdom. But I am so grateful to the people who come and participate because you all are a community. This is how we come together. We share, we, we, we build up each other. Um, and so glad that you are here tonight and that we could share this exchange. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you all. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.